Culp's Hill, July 2nd, 1863. A bunch of New Yorkers. A man named James Duran. And the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse, March 31st, 1865. All of this collides in a tragic story. How? That's what we're going to find out today. Today I'm headed out to the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse, which is actually stretched out over several miles of roads. And there's only really one roadside exhibit out there that talks about the battle and it has several signs, interpretive signs with maps. So I'm gonna go over there and try to get the maps off of there for this video and then talk about the fight as best I can and then take you to the courthouse. But along the way, we're also gonna talk about James Duran who was with the 149th New York at the Battle of Gettysburg at Culp's Hill on July 2nd, 1863. If you come out here to get uh, to uh, Virginia, you're going to see a lot of trenches, a lot of earthworks, especially here in the Petersburg network. Um, the Petersburg Battlefield Association has a lot of interpretive signs that are around that will tell you the story about the fights that happened out here but they also work really close with other organizations, including the National Park and um, Battlefield Trust and the Civil War Trail System to preserve these locations for posterity. So I highly recommend you coming out here to Petersburg and checking this stuff out, especially now, 2024, 1864, 160th anniversary. These fields move during these anniversaries. You can feel something. It's different. March 27th, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant had a plan. He wanted to take the Southside Railroad, and he knew that Robert E. Lee's lines were arced and thin, going back towards that, that base that he had his men in at that right flank. So he calls on Phil Sheridan, and he tells Phil Sheridan to take his 9,500 troopers out towards that flank and to uh, feign an attack in another location, but then make his way towards that right flank near Dinwiddie Courthouse. Phil Sheridan, supported by the 2nd and 5th Corps, come out here. And on the 28th of March, those soldiers drew five days rations with the expectations that they would get out here and have a complete and total victory. But it didn't turn out that way. Now, 
when they get out here anyways, it's not like there's a whole lot here at Dinwiddie. There was a previous raid that took place, um, the Wilson and Counts raid, and that wasn't, wasn't a, a pleasant situation because every, every stop along the way that these guys went into those towns, they were tearing up the towns, essentially. They would go into the courthouses and burn documents. They would uh, burn down buildings. They would take livestock um, and do anything they could to disrupt the supply lines of Robert E. Lee's army here because they were trying to get them out of those trenches and they were trying to affect that army as best as they, they could. And it meant a lot of death and destruction along the way, which also included uh, making war on civilians because the civilian sector was what was supplying that army at that time. Uh, without those civilians in the Confederacy supplying that army, there's absolutely no way Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia has any supplies to feed that army, make ammunition, or supply the accoutrements that are needed for the army, including shoes and clothing and anything else. So Dinwiddie was kind of a shell of itself by the time the Battle of Dinwiddie took place. On the 29th of March, 1865, Phil Sheridan had just rejoined, not too long before that, uh, just rejoined the army here in Petersburg. His unit had been up in Shenandoah, causing havoc up there. And when he gets down here, he immediately gets sent into the fight. And on the 29th, he's pacing back and forth like a chafed town, is what one man said because there's a torrential downpour happening and he's at Dinwiddie Courthouse and he's telling everybody that he's ready to go to smashing everything. So in other words, he's itching. He's itching to get out here and get into these fields and start fighting the Confederate Army wherever he can find them. Um, but that fight on the, 20, on the 31st of March would turn out to be uh, not exactly what he would hope for. He had about 10,000 troopers out here, 9,500 to 10,000 cavalry men on his, on his side fighting. Robert E. Lee, sensing something was up, like he always does, um, ends up sending 5,500 men with Pickett's mobile, newly formed mobile unit out into this direction. And then Fitz U. Lee ends up having 5,000 cavalry men who are basically guarding Five Forks to keep the Southside Railroad uh, in check so that uh, it's not taken captive by the Union soldiers. And that sets the stage for what we have happened here on March 31st of 1865 at the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse. Now to give you a little orientation on where we are right now. Out in this location, heading up off in that direction there on that road, Devon, Merritt, and Crook are out in that location and they're facing Mumford and uh, Pickett who are headed towards Davies as well. Where I'm standing now, Smith from the Union Army has his units and they're coming up in this direction towards us right now. Off in this direction over here, however, this is where Rosser and WHF Lee are coming from with Johnson in support. And they're hitting this flank over here of, uh, of Sheridan's unit that's out here in this field, just um, on the other side of where the courthouse is. 
So you have to drive away from the courthouse and actually uh, hit up coordinates on the GPS to be able to find this place. And I'll put that in the, uh, the description of the video so that you can actually come out here if you ever make your way out to Petersburg. So Sheridan disperses his Union Cavalry Corps and advanced on the high ground near Dinwiddie Courthouse, which is where we were just at. Now, over here to, uh, to this direction, Davies Ford is, uh, is over here, or Fitzgerald's Ford's over here. And Colonel Charles H. Smith's brigade picketed the stream crossing, and General Henry Davies' uh, brigade guarded Danza's Ford about one half mile to the north. To the northeast, Colonel Peter Stagg's brigade moved up the Crump Road, approaching the critical White Oak Road. And we'll put a map up on the screen so you can see what we're talking about at this point. Um, Colonel Charles Fitzhugh's brigade proceeded up the Dinwiddie Courthouse Road towards Five Forks. Brigadier General Alfred Gig Gibbs' brigade was in reserve at the Bossier Farm, or Basso. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. On March 31st, 1865, Confederate Major General Fitzhugh Lee's cavalrymen and Major General Pickett's infantrymen marched over muddy roads west of Chamberlain's Bed with the intentions of crossing the stream at Fitzgerald's Ford and flanking Sheridan's troops. Finding the crossing blocked by entrenched Union cavalry, Pickett's infantrymen retraced their steps and marched for Danza's Ford. Major General W.H.F. Rooney Lee's uh, cavalry attacked Smith's Federal Brigade here at Fitzgerald's Ford at approximately 11 a.m. So we'll pull that map up off of the screen now so you can see. We're talking about 11 o'clock now. So this is the middle of the day in March. If you know anything about this location in March, middle of the day, it can be raining, it could be snowing, it could be extremely cold. There could be sleet. It could be anything out here. The weather's kind of unpredictable around that time, but one thing's for sure, it's not leafed out like it is right now. The trees are definitely dead. Um, spring has not taken effect, so it's still fairly miserable out here. And on the 29th of March, that's what it was. It was miserable, rainy, wet. Um, just a terrible time had by all. When they get out here, I'm sure the streams were probably pretty swollen as well. And uh, at 11 o'clock, this is really where it kicks off, right here, for the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse. So how this initially all starts out here is I have Adams Road that runs out in the direction in front of me. And going out there in that direction, we have um, Gibbs and Stagg essentially heading off in that direction. Fitzhugh for the Union Army with Devon are heading off on to Dinwiddie Courthouse Road, which kind of goes out in that direction there. And then you have Davies and Smith, which are facing the opposing forces off in this direction over here. Uh, separated. So Mumford's coming down Dinwiddie Courthouse Road. And I'm looking at a map right now. This is the reason why I'm trying to keep my facts straight as I'm looking at this map. And then uh, you have Pickett, Rosser, and WHF Lee heading down the Ford Station Road, which is off in this direction over here. And Johnson's in support of them. So as they're heading in this direction, 
you now have Mumford heading from this direction here. And this army is, it's separated right now. The positions of the Confederate army are completely in opposite directions. And the Union is attacking all from the front here and going up these roads and traveling off in this direction over here. But then as the battle continues on, going to some more maps, what happens is the, the Union Cavalry, um, I guess it underestimated its enemy out here. Because when the, when the enemy came out of those trenches over at Five Forks and they were coming across these fields, they got organized pretty fast. And based on the movements itself, somehow Pickett ends up poking a hole in the line of uh, Sheridan's uh, troopers out here. And when he creates that separation, Smith and Davies and Fitzhugh all end up being separated from each other. And as, um, as we go along here, and you can tell by when you're going through these maps here on these signs, you can see how it's all starting to unfold. Now everything is, is getting more, con more consolidated. Johnson, Pickett, and Mumford are now coming down this Dinwiddie Courthouse Road and ending up on Adams Road like we talked about earlier. Greg and Gibbs are facing them on Adams Road. Smith is facing this direction. Greg and Gibbs are facing this direction. And Lee and Rosser are opposing Smith. And Greg and Gibbs are opposing Johnson, Pickett, and Mumford. And they're pushing them down that Adams Road that we're talking about. At about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, they have no choice. The, the, the Confederates are coming across these fields with reckless abandon. And one of the Union soldiers that were out here said it was almost as if these soldiers loved being on a picket line or loved being a picket soldier because they were charging across these fields with reckless abandon for their own life and they just didn't understand how they could be so careless with their own lives. But this is where, according to the, the folklore surrounding it, the last real uh, rebel yell was, was heard across these fields here. As these men were actually charging in victory, uh, they came up and over the hills here directly behind me and and across the road here in front of me And they were forcing the Union cavalry on its heels back towards Dinwiddie Courthouse Custer is back there at that courthouse with that rear guard Custer is furiously piling up fence uh, fence posts dirt mounding stuff up to prepare for an ultimate attack there because they think that they're about to be overran that afternoon starts to wind down, and it's March, it's cold, uh, the nighttime comes, and that night, the uh, Union Cavalry are off in that direction at Dinwiddie Courthouse. And across these fields, they can see big bonfires from these Confederate soldiers out here who are having a great time, and they can hear their bands playing music, and they feel very excited about the victory that they've just completed here on these fields. Um, but Pickett realizes he can't stray far from Five Forks. So at some point, he decides he's going to call his men back and start pushing them back towards the Five Forks position to get back in their fortifications. Sheridan, on the other hand, realizes that the moment uh, is an opportunity that he can't lose. So he reports back to Grant and he tells Grant that if I'm separated from the Army, uh, the United States Army, then that means Pickett is separated from Lee and we can't let him get back to Lee and his trenches. So the next day, on April 1st, he decides he's going to come out across these fields uh, with fury and he's going to hit that army out here in these fields. But he's too late. They are headed back towards their trenches and he cannot hit them where they were sitting overnight. They get back there to that location just in time for the fight that takes place at the Battle of Five Forks. And the last major offensive here at Petersburg is starting to take place. Eventually, the Army in Northern Virginia would be broken and pushed out of these fortifications and put on the run towards Appomattox Courthouse, where the eventual surrender would take place. And here in just a second, we'll talk about one of those soldiers that was out here on this field.
149th New York, July 2nd, 1863. They're called into action to fill in a gap at Culp's Hill. And they're right next to the 122nd. Both units were recruited out of the same location in New York. A lot of them knew each other. So what in the world does that have to do with the Battle of the Dimwitty Courthouse? Well, we're about to find out here shortly. Like I said previously, the uh, 149th was recruited out of Onondaga, New York. And so was the 122nd. Both of those units end up side by side at Culp's Hill, fighting and defending against the Confederate soldiers that are trying to take that hill. I'm sure that some of them probably had conversations with each other along the way. But it was reported that when the 149th showed up, that the cheers from the 122nd was so loud that it actually drowned out the sound of the battle that was happening around them. This was a pretty neat situation for them. Captain John Doran uh, was the captain of Company K for 149th. When 149th was formed, um, it was mostly because Captain John Doran. He was a very positive role model and figure for that unit. And he actually spearheaded the recruitment of Company K. And when they started to uh, vote on who was going to be in charge who was going to be the captain of that unit it was a clear and easy pick for them they decided to pick Doran so he gets out to the field in Gettysburg and on July 2nd he ends up getting injured pretty badly when they take that position at Culp's Hill he ends up taking a bullet to the forearm that runs down near where his wrist is and Doran is carted off the field by his men. Nevertheless, it doesn't kill the spirits of the New Yorkers that are there, and they are victorious at Culp's Hill and victorious at Gettysburg. Doran, however, would have to go back home and recuperate from the severe wound that he had to his arm. He heads back home, and he would go back home for the last time. The 149th would uh, leave in late September from their hometown, and they would end up with uh, with the 12th Corps, 
and fight at Chancellorsville, where they would receive the, the first real fight of their military career. And not to mention a lot of casualties there at that battle. And it's only a couple of months later that Doran is now in the fight again at Gettysburg and he's in and he's wounded pretty bad to the point to where he has to be sent back home. There's actually a photo of James Sr. with his horse and his son, James Jr., who's 10 years old at the time. And it was taken right before James Sr. heads back to the Army. His son, in the photo, I'll put it up on the screen for you. His son's standing at the head of the horse and he's holding the reins. And his father is dressed up, ready to go for battle. And he's in the, uh, in the picture there at the rear of the horse facing his son. James Jr. wouldn't know it, but after that picture was taken and his father would go back to the Army to end up in the 24th Cavalry, that would be the last time that James Jr. would have his entire family together. And it wouldn't just be his father that was gone. March 31st, 1865, the 24th New York comes charging across these fields out here at Dinwiddie Courthouse. James Sr. is a part of that unit. He had just joined them not too long before this. And he's charging bravely across these fields. But then he's hit again. A bullet tears into his thigh, smashes the bone on the inside. His men have to grab him and help him off the field and in a hurry because the Confederates are coming on strong. As they pick him up and he's screaming the entire time because of the pain, they go to take him off the field and then that's when it happens. A bullet hits his right shoulder, tears through his chest and exited his left shoulder. Somehow he is still alive. As James Sr. is laying on the field, not able to help himself, the Confederates take him prisoner of war. The Union soldiers left him behind, along with other soldiers that were left on the field still wounded, because they had been hit fast, and they are now retreating back towards Dinwiddie Courthouse. As a result, he ends up a prisoner of war, and he's in the care of an unidentified woman out here in the local area. And she took the best care of him that she could, considering the fact that his right lung had actually been punctured and he lost the ability to breathe properly as a result. Well, he's turned back over to the Union forces in less than a day. And some say that they think it was because of the severity of the wound, there was no way for them to take care of him, really. And at that time, the Confederacy had very limited means because of where they were in the war. It's 1865, they're at Five Forks, and in just a day or two later, they're going to be leaving this position, evacuating and headed towards Appomattox Courthouse, where they would surrender. James Sr. is taken to City Point, and in just a few short days, he would take his last breaths there, and he would die. Now, that begins the misery for James Jr. James Jr. has already had a bad, rough life as it is. His dad's been off to war for a long time. He has two siblings there with him that are younger than he is. 
he can't hear because he's a deaf kid. And just a couple of months prior to the fight out here, his mother dies of some sort of disease. So he's in the car, uh, in the care of a, a guardian at that time, and his father's now dead. He grows up without his mother or his father, and he has his siblings with him. And in 1905, tragedy strikes again. He's a postmaster clerk in a small town. And in 1905, he's crossing a railroad track where he ends up being hit by a train and killed at the age of 52. For the Doran family, Gettysburg and the Civil War is a very, very tragic event in their lives. And it takes the lives of the most respected people in their family. And for that boy, he would grow up to be an older man, but you have to wonder how his life might have turned out had his parents still been around and not died of disease or died out here on the battlefield. James Sr. was a brave individual fighting with the cavalry, and he died as a brave individual fighting with the cavalry, and he left his children behind. And that's just one of the stories of the different faces that fought at Gettysburg and how they relate and tie into other battles along the way. So what does Dinwiddie Courthouse Battle accomplish anyhow? Well, it's kind of a touch and go feel here. Sheridan realizes he's got an opportunity to attack and he thinks he's gonna break the lines, which he's right. Pickett on the other hand is back here at Five Forks. He's just been involved in a major fight. He kind of thinks nothing else is gonna happen. Nothing's gonna come of that. So he lets his guard down. And then the Waterloo of the Confederacy happens out here at Five Forks. Now talking about James Doran, um, who died at the battle of, uh, as a result of the battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse. As a twist of fate, he would actually die on the 14th of April, the same day that Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. He ends up living long enough to see the day that Robert E. Lee's army surrenders, but he dies on the 14th. So. It's, it's stories like these throughout the American Civil War that link together different places and times that you can find if you dig and read and connect the dots. There are a lot of stories like these. And you wonder why. Well, the plain and simple reason why is because it's stories about people. And that's the stories I like to tell not just about the large battles and the tactics. I like to talk about the people too. That's what we have here. The story of James Duran, the Battle of Gettysburg, and eventually, Dinwiddie Courthouse. <laughs>